Peter Coronius from the Cybersecurity Advisors Network here with a lot of our members today and we're talking about the current threat environment with particular reference to the Microsoft Exchange Server hack that's going down at the moment, uh, hot on the heels, off the heels of the solar winds attack that we saw, I guess it was just before Christmas. So uh, without any further ado, I'm going to hand over to the three of our speakers who are quickly, which I'll, who I'll introduce. We've got Mark Bernard, Fergus Brooks, and Ned Farhat, all good science members. They're a, a expert in their respective fields. And I just want to get some insights from you guys about what you're seeing at the moment, what you think this means. Uh, is it more of the same, or is this qualitatively different from anything we've seen before? And, you know, any final sort of high-level takeouts that you can give us at this point in the attack cycle. So uh, let's start with Mark. Okay. What fascinates me is that the whole state actor angle on this thing, you know, and it's almost like with great power comes great responsibility. And I, I think that the one that really got my attention and got my interest actually was the Stuxnet attack, which was now, what, 11, 12 years ago? Mm -hmm. I guess everybody in cybersecurity probably knows the story quite well. So you've got a state actor doing incredibly dangerous things in the cyber world, in a mm. sense, um, but ultimately for a good cause, I, I, I would argue. <laughs> right. Fewer nuclear weapons in, a, in the hands of a dangerous government. Um, on the other hand, you've got you know, solar winds, which is who knows what the Russians were trying to do. Fascinating. And I think in terms of where it's going, it's, it's not going to stop because you've got these motivations, whether it's Iran, North Korea, China, Russia, Israel, they're all in the game. Um, I think progressively we're going to see it tighten up more and more. I mean, the Microsoft vulnerability was around for, for years and nobody had exploited it. And then suddenly, you know, some hackers in China figured it out and then that's it, they went to town. Um, you, you can't mitigate against that 100%. So every organization, the more critical you are as an organization, banks, insurance companies, obviously infrastructure, particularly big in Australia, gas, coal, power, pl uh, power plants, water, all of that stuff, you got to have a response for when something goes wrong, and you've got to have that put in place by professionals and ready just to press the button when there is an emergency so you're not caught with not knowing what to do, basically. That would be my takeaway. Right. This is a good segue to Fergus, who now is in the uh, arm of a major Australian bank. What, what do you think the current attacks tell us about, or, you know, I mean, I, was, I read 6,000 Australian servers exposed to the MS Exchange hack. What, what, is that, what is that telling? I mean, is this just more of the same that we're seeing? Or what's your take on, on this? It's a good question. And, and first of all, I just wanted to say that um, I, think, I think the Black Hat community should say a big hearty thank you to the NSA um, for, you know, for some of the uh, hacking tools that are out there, which True. was the internal blue vulnerability, which was responsible for the WannaCry ransomware attack, which caused the world by storm. Yeah. Stuxnet has been used multiple times That's by right. other Dooku people. And yeah, Flame. Yeah, 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 which I think is interesting. So they get, their hacking tools get hacked, but then we saw FireEye's hacking tools get hacked or mm. other, other tools get hacked, which is all interesting. But I think to, to Peter's question where, where I think we've lost a lot of focus after the, over the last couple of years is on this concept of a zero hour or zero day, I prefer to say zero hour vulnerability, where we're actually looking at something that hasn't been patched yet. You know, so there's a lot of focus on patch cycles and making sure that we're getting patches out quickly and patch Tuesday and all this kind of stuff. What if something hasn't been patched and all of a sudden they can go out and potentially exploit X number of systems? Um, and the heuristics on your antivirus products can't pick up on it. Your intrusion detection products don't pick up on it. Uh, all this kind of stuff. And I think to your point, with the SolarWinds, so SolarWinds is very different, uh, but still it gave everyone the fright of their life. What if we'd been SolarWinds? You know, and in which case you would have hackers all over your network, which have been for months. Mm. So how does an organization recover from that? Well, how do they respond for a start? And how Just to clarify SolarWinds, my understanding of that was that the patch itself it was compromised which is a big sort of uh, speed bump or a you know a disconnect between the, the standard advice that we're saying is you should patch regularly and often and soon and yet the solar winds attack was actually people apparently doing the right thing they were patching but the 
credentials of the patch have been messed patch with. carried the infection. Yeah. yeah. So, so I mean that that's that, and that's a really interesting thing where some of the larger organisations that I know of that, that dodged that bullet haven't got around to patching it. <laughs> Which is ironic. So kind of perverse <laughs> there. So ironic when by not doing the right thing, they were actually safer. But I mean, so really we've got two very different attacks then, haven't we? Really, we've got one that's occurring because you haven't patched, and the other's occurring because you have patched. And the consequences for both will, could be equally serious. I, su I suspect that in some cases it's it's a one trick. You, know, you can only pull that lever once. You know, So now that we know that a patch can actually be infected, you're gonna have everybody releasing a patch going over that thing with a forensic right. fine tooth comb, wouldn't you say? Well, yeah, Much more I, than in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, really think that what's changed a little bit here, which should have changed a while ago, um, uh, a long time ago, if, if I had anything to do with it, is you've got to be better prepared. There is no, there's no winning this war. It's a war of attrition, there is no winning. Um, and a, 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 an excellent uh, professor, Les Bell is his name, I think he's, I don't know which university he's associated with now, but he puts up this excellent graph when he presents, which just basically says that the bad guys are here. You know, the technology company's ability to patch is here. Uh, and then get all the way down to regulation and, you know, law enforcement. They're ahead of the game. So we're all constantly in this war of attrition. So I don't think enough organisations have been paying enough attention on how do we respond and being prepared to respond to these incidents. Um, but certainly, you know, where I'm, what I'm doing at the moment is taking that to the next level of saying, well, okay, we've had an incident, we're responding to the incident, we finally get rid of the bad guys, maybe we can't get completely rid of the bad guys. How do we get the organisation back up and running? Because people depend on us. Mm -hmm. um, and that sort of level of operational maturity, if you like, these things just work to highlight. And I kind of sort of look at them when I see them happening and go, we knew this was going to happen. <laughs> Um, I'm not a big fan of a it's not if it's when conversations, but I, I have heard that becoming very mainstream. Uh, but we've kind of known that in the cyber area for a while. So I think these <coughs> things sort of reinforce it. Um, and what was it, 8,000 on-premise um, exchange servers may mm -hmm. have been impacted? Is that it? Um, do we, I don't do, think anyone's do, do we actually, a number do we actually, do we actually know? We Is that know. a number that we know? But that's a good estimate. Mm. Anyway, so. Great. Ned. One of the aspects of the um, current the Microsoft attack is this idea of remote access. Yeah. And, and, and in fact, um, Mark mentioned the um, Pathmian group, the Chinese group, but I read a report today that said they've identified at least 10 other APTs that have already mm -hmm. been taking advantage of this same vulnerability. Yeah. So now they're, they're in there and they're positioning backdoors into the system what concerns you about the way in which companies respond to these kind of attacks? That they is there a risk of a false sense of security that they think they've got rid of? Right, because the problem we have here is that one, we actually don't know. Okay, and once once you've been compromised, just like a solo wing compromised, you know, they've been there that long. They've guaranteed they've put persistence in place so they can get back in again. Plus, where else have they been ferreting and putting things in? And it's all a, this whole hoarding of zero days. Does my head in. Whether it's NSA or not, there's no such thing as a secret that we only know. It's a bit like now our own government trying to backdoor encryption because they'll have the master key, but no one will else have it. If you've got it, someone else has got it. I don't care. If it exists, it's exploited. And these are things that we're discovering are exploited. Like over the exchange, I'm hearing numbers above 30,000 now. Realistically, I can go and show Dan, see how many are exposed, and that, that's, that's your minimum. Because the reality is, they're out there, you know, they're using Showdown, they're using all the tools that are available to them, and they're out there exploiting as many as they can and then it's not like it used to be one once upon a time say ransomware what initially the first came out was spray and pray yeah they just infected everyone they hit off for 500 bucks you kind of deal you gave them 350 and they let you off and, they, and yeah they didn't know who you were they didn't care even and i had so many dodgy gmail accounts i used to communicate with these guys to negotiate and you know, give them a sob story and whatever now they've already researched you they know you, they know your annual budget they know how much money you got in the bank they know who your ceo is They've researched you and they said, right, you're worth 50 mil, give us 10 of those, yeah? And you can't argue, they already know who you are, yeah? The, the nature of things has changed. Solar winds, again, it's changed. It wasn't when once upon a time it was, you know, you find a door, you get in and you, you look around, it's like, no, no, no. Someone was very clever about this. And like you said about that graph, you know, we talk, you talk about innovation, we don't innovate, you know, we react. They innovate and we follow, yeah? We're mm -hmm. always up, we're always behind. So 
The solar winds attack, yeah, again, put the nasty side of it aside, I think it was brilliant. Yeah, it's very smart. It's textbook. Okay, it was brilliant, right? It went straight to the source. It's yeah. worth a Hollywood movie. It is, because yeah. in one hit, you impacted how many government agencies? Forget all the other little people that you impacted too. I mean, banks a little bit in terms of, yeah, they've got some nice stuff, but the government stuff is probably what they're after, right? Every right. arm of the US military has been impacted. In one hit, right? Yeah. I'd have to go hack the 50 of them. I hacked one, and bang. And they were in there for how long? And they were saying, oh, there's 10 others. Again, back to the point of, if there's a back door, if there's a hole, you know, you're not the only one who knows about it. Yeah, the only one maybe talking about it, but everyone else is sitting there. There's how many NSAs out there all doing the same thing, hoarding these zero days going, mate, this is our little secret. And yeah, you know, we've even seen them where groups are locking out other groups. They'll use the zero day to get in and patch the system to block out everyone else, right? <laughs> that's like, that's like, well, this is the sort of thing that's going on now, right? The whole landscape has shifted. My biggest concern is that we're always telling people like, you know, why is that nuclear control system on the internet? In this case, exchange is supposed to be on the internet. So I think the problem we're having now with the, say, the exchange attack is we become very tunnel vision where they build a big, build a bigger bomb, we build a bigger gun to count, whatever it is. And we just, we're going down the wrong path. We've got to actually, I think, go back to some basics, yeah? So if it's going to be exposed on the internet, break it up. Don't have one big pig of a system sitting there on the internet with just 4,000 doors in there. You try to patch every single one, check the doors every day. You can't do that. We've really got to start rethinking how we build software. We've got to start thinking how we deploy things. Yeah. If it, I'd say an exchange server, that shouldn't be the one big beast facing the internet. There should be some yeah, defense in depth, have a component. Yeah. When you've got a billion lines of code or whatever it is, how do you even verify that's correct? How do you verify you've tracked and caught? every scenario, you've tested every, you can't. It's just, it's just ridiculous, right? And in the end, the big race to market, yeah, everyone has to be quick, because now we're all agile now, yeah? Yeah, we become more fragile, not agile, yeah? It's just, everyone's just a big, big race to get out there, get the latest shiny toy out there. So we've really got to rethink it. Now, something like an exchange should be maybe two or three modules, yeah? One very small piece, which opens the door to the internet. And I'll say small, because then you can verify the, the correctness of the code, you can verify the, yeah, the security of the code and say, right, the front door is secure. The rest of it may be a bit, you know, a bit smelly, but at least this part here we can say good. The piece, a proxy piece behind it, maybe. Right, again, something short and sharp and simple that you could potentially verify before you start exposing, you know, yeah, yeah, the, the crown jewels to the internet. And that, that's a, yeah, so like I said, I think we're attacking this the wrong way. We're, we're just keep building bigger bombs to try and attack these guys, but we're always reacting, you know, because they're innovating and we've, we're, we're playing catch up. And, what we're seeing here is we're not even catching up like, oh, it's a zero day within a week or a quarter. Now they've been using it for six months. And then we start finding out, well, actually they've been hanging around the environment for three years maybe now. Well, geez, okay. We, we know it's been for three years, but we don't, what we don't know is how much longer was it before that? Mm -hmm. What else don't we know about? Where else are they lurking in there? And we're seeing now persistence, it's no longer just a matter of, oh, I infect the machine, I open the back door. They're infecting now firmware. So you reboot the machine, you reformat the whole computer, you blow it away, you know what, I'm going to put Windows on it, I'm going to put Linux on it. But they've infected the firmware on the bloody hard drive. Right. And the persistence is there. Who's checking? What antivirus checks the firmware? And even then, we're talking about patches, checking patches. How do we check a patch realistically? I mean, for the, for the average person, who's going to be able to you know, decompile a Microsoft patch and say it's good? Yeah, you just you can't. Yeah. So I think we're just going down this path where we're not going to win with, with the current approach. We've really got to just take a step back and rethink things and just have a whole new sort of paradigm around it because it's getting more sophisticated, it's getting more, it's more, much more complicated. We just can't keep doing it, yeah? The average person, like my mother, what hope does she have? Yeah? Like, yeah, she gets some buttons, says, update, she says, okay, update, boom. Yeah? What would she do? She, she thinks she's doing the right thing. We've yeah. been telling him for 20 years to do that. That's right. That's right. Finally, she got the idea that she has to do it. Look, did you want to respond? No, Go I'm ahead. just thinking that you've, you've got the next level, which is um, there was a bunch of uh, US manufacturer had a bunch of motherboards manufactured yeah. in China. Oh, well, super micro. And then just, yeah, well, one day some engineers looking at it and comparing the blueprint, he goes, oh, there's a little chip there that's not on the design what's that right there yeah. size of half a grain of rice yeah. they open it up they, they it's a back door straight to beijing 
the US Navy took a million dollars worth of motherboards and just chucked them out because there was nothing you could do to, to mitigate that. You know what I mean? So that's, what I mean, right? that's like next level. That's exactly it, right? Now what you're getting, what you're getting now, some circuitry, for example, you can't even see the bloody motherboard because you've got a blob of epoxy on a board. Over it. That blob of epoxy could be bloody. You've got to know where it was manufactured. <laughs> But, but, know and and even then, right? So supply chain is the next big problem we have. Absolutely. And it's not even a matter of whether it's China or Russia. Yeah? Let's be honest now. As a country, we shouldn't be trusting anybody. So we know the US spies on us. We spy, you know, but they've got buses spying on Germany. It's been their ally. There's, everyone is screwing everyone at the moment. And this whole uh, sort of la la thing, we've got, we've got allies. No, we don't. We've got people that attack us as much as the others, that's all. <laughs> yeah? So we have to be serious there. We have to think of Australia as a sovereign country protect our own selves and look at our own supply chain because we are exposed to everyone and yeah, not just China, yeah? But even like US software, right? That's a very big call though. I mean, yeah. it's not a trivial thing to establish a sem semiconductor industry no, from true, a start. But the question is then becomes, uh, so how much trust do you put on things though? And just because it came from, made in the USA, shouldn't be a sign I'd say, oh, we'll just sort of like, no, we look at that like everything else because again, it could be a potential exposure. We don't know what it is. And where are the components coming from? Yeah. I mean, that's the other thing. It still may have come from Taiwan anyway, right? Yeah. And then you make a call as to who you are worried about being exposed to versus who you're less worried about being exposed to, which could be the yeah. US, the UK, Singapore, Taiwan. Um, I think I think there's, you know, know who your friends are. In this yeah. case, you can't keep your enemies closer, <laughs> but you can keep your friends close. Well, this is the thing, right? So I, I guess it's just as a matter of, like, of an approach, you know, sometimes I feel like we're too busy looking that way and we're not looking over here what's happening, right? And it could be not necessarily your ally is your enemy, but it could be they've trusted someone who they shouldn't have, and now we're exposed again, right? So, sorry, I was a couple, couple of things. I just wanted to say on the solar winds one that um, so a friend of mine uh, said, oh, "What's the big deal about this solar winds one?" It seems like there's a big deal. I said, "Oh, you know, no idea how big a deal it is." And he said, so, well, "What do you mean?" I said, "Well, one of the components of the Orion suite of software, this is why it's textbook, yeah. is a packet sniffer." So if you've got control of the network monitoring software, you can deploy a packet sniffer on the network. Not many organizations have the uh, capacity of the network to be able to encrypt everything in terms of the processing power on their routers and switches. So things are floating around the inside network. So they've been there for months. They've got people's passwords. Think like Ashley Madison, but think even worse. So it's been there for ages. So how do you clean up on that? But I think to Ned's point and, and to Mark's point as well, is that this this, this um, concept of every time something comes out, and if I hear another federal politician say it's China or it's Russia, yeah. or they've had a system failure because they've bought the wrong thing, um, it's going to make me really angry. And this constant pointing the finger at these APT groups, so I think you're what you're getting at, which is defend yourself from everyone. Yeah. Um, yeah. And stop thinking that maybe in our Five Eyes Alliance we have, maybe this is controversial, <laughs> that we have, um, that we have, People that you can trust, etc. Whereas espionage has no boundaries. Yeah. So, what I'm hearing is that this zero trust paradigm has to extend beyond organisations and even beyond supply chain partners. It actually has to extend to to strategic alliances between nations. Yeah. Taken, <laughs> this goes to another bit of segue here to something completely other discussion. Where is hacking really an act of war? Right. When it's nation state doing it, just because we didn't fire a bullet and kill someone directly or didn't blow up a building, is it really just another act of war anyway? I mean, we saw in the US recently where they started messing around with the um, the water water treatment plant, right? Imagine now that 11,000 people try to race to a hospital, they've all been poisoned, right? It's, it's, it's worse than the coronavirus because with the coronavirus, okay, you had people on a bit of like a couple of days maybe, a bit of a ramp up, this year, everyone drank some water today. And now tomorrow morning, you've got 11,000 people lying around, dying, you've got kids, you've got, you've got to pick who you treat first. This is a, a, like a back, almost like act of genocide, right? So here's, here's my final question. And I think it's right the right time to ask this. Critical attacks against critical infrastructure. Yeah. We haven't seen that much touch wood so far yet. We did have one of the first in the world in Australia in 2002. The Maruchador water treatment plant, do you remember that case? So it was a disgruntled subcontractor that decided to spill 200,000 litres of raw sewage into the water supply through his laptop. So that was that made kind of history. But really, it's been quite quiet on the critical infrastructure front, by and large, in terms of crippling infrastructure that we know of. 
Stuxnet was obviously a proof of concept that worked well within its limited environment, then went into the wild, as you observed. But when, how, how long do you think before we see actual outages of critical infrastructure in Australia as a, as a result of nation state activity? Do you think it's weeks, years, months, never? I think that they're already preparing for this sort of stuff, but it's one of those triggers you don't pull later. So that, that one, that, that, that attack on the water plant, that seemed more like um, someone just screwing around. It wasn't intelligent. Yeah? It was just someone found a big button and goes, oh, I'll press this. Yeah, and there's dumped a whole lot of chemicals that triggered the whole lot of alarm. But imagine someone had been actually trickling, you know, increasing it. So if I was to like mess with someone's dosage by 0.1 mil a day, over the course of a week, I'm actually doing causing impact, but no one's going to notice, right? And if small variations below certain thresholds, so, you know, I, I believe that these countries have all got these little, you know, toolbox of zero days that they're, they're hoarding, ready to do something really nasty, should they ever be pushed, but, Again, that's that's now becomes an open declaration of war, as opposed to now where oh, we attacked a computer system. Yeah, it's sort of like um, yeah, it's sort of seen as soft. Yeah, like it wasn't hard. It wasn't a hard hit. Yeah, a building didn't blow up and didn't kill anyone. So yeah, but it's only a declaration of war if there's attribution. And this is where the nuclear deterrent, you know, concept breaks down in cyber. They've been talking for years about developing norms mm. of cyber behaviour. And Kissinger called for it. One of the last things he said publicly was, um, we need a cyber detente. But I think the difference between nuclear and cyber is that with nuclear, you could have a detente because you always had attribution. You could see where the yeah. silos were being, you know, the missiles were being launched from. And attribution has become so political now, right? Mm. Like, yeah, you know, something happens within three minutes, someone said, oh, it's China. Like, really? You, you knew that already? And you've got false flag attacks as well. Exactly. Right. And, and it's the thing, they keep saying, oh, because the signature they used. Well, we know what happens, right? So you can always blame out everything for the NSA because the signature was used. Yeah, well, and we know, like I said, false flag. <laughs> it's not that hard to copy code. It's a lot harder to copy a nuclear uh, a nuclear missile than it is to copy a chunk of code, which chances are landed on one of their, one of their honeypot machines anyway, and they've, They've got the whole thing, yeah. They managed to get sucked down a few more of the payloads. They've built up this little thing. Okay, fantastic. You can redeploy that. Check so the this is all very depressing. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, who was it said um, said that economics is the dismal science? I can't remember the economist, but I'm thinking like cybersecurity is the dismal profession because we're contemplating. Not, I mean, it's not when you know, if, but when type thing. Where's the light at the end of the tunnel? Are you guys seeing any short, medium term prospects of uh, greater resilience within our national, international systems? Or do you think there's a lot more pain that has to be felt before sort of we begin to innovate in the ways that you suggest? I think our problem at the moment is an asymmetric war. And the problem is we don't have an issue of racing to the bottom. And that's where I think the issue is. Because as long as we're prepared to build a bigger gun and just keep going for it, I mean, there's no way the US would want any sort of, um, yeah, sort of a risen kind of uh, understanding that, you know what, we're not gonna play nice on the internet. We're gonna stop this thing. And the way they see it, it's an asymmetric war and they're gonna knock a hand and they're gonna milk it as far as they can until they know what we can. And they'll be like, no, no, we shouldn't, we shouldn't be doing this. Right. And I think we're going down the same path again now where, it's asymmetric in that it's in their favor. Until it's no longer in their favor, there'll be a declaration of, we should, yeah, let's put some rules in place. Let's stop hacking each other. Let's not attack hospitals or critical infrastructure. Mm -hmm. uh, that's just my opinion. Yeah. I'm depressing. Any final thoughts, guys? Can I comment on that? <laughs> <laughs> you know, the light at the end of the tunnel, I think, uh, I think, unfortunately, no, I can't say it. Um, you know, you mentioned before that a couple of nations have proved the concepts. Um, you know, WannaCry was a big one because at, then it became NotPetya. Mm -hmm. NotPetya was the first time we saw something which was labelled destruction as a service. I just want to see the world burn. Um, and when you've got an attack like that, what do you do? You know, if, some, if someone's prepared to bring down their own networks at the same time as they bring down yours, what do you do? How do you defend yourself against it? I think the light at the, the, light at the end of the tunnel, maybe, um, is that we are starting to see more maturity. We're seeing more maturity at board level. 
we're seeing a real level of understanding that these things can be absolutely crippling to our business. Critical Infrastructure Commission of Australia has a huge focus on this. Um, and they've got people from the energy sector, the banking, finance sector, and this kind of stuff, to a point where it's like, okay, they're gonna get us. So how do we keep the wheels turning? Is, is this sort of more evolved way of thinking? Um, and unfortunately, unless we stop adopting new technology, which we're not going to, imagine 10 years ago, <laughs> what we carried in our hands, the compute power of that, compared to what we carry in our hands now. So we're not gonna give it up with all the convenience, with all that stuff. So without stopping on the technology front, we just have to continue to be resilient. I think that's relatively advanced, but also focus on how do we keep the wheels turning when these bad things happen, sort of is, is what I would say. So focus is on continuity and recovery. The, the, the whole perimeter defense concept went out the window years ago. The assumption is they're in, they're active, they're pre-positioned, back doors, whatever else, they can do whatever they want, basically. You assume that, that now becomes your starting assumption, starting set of assumptions. Now, how do we carry forward from there? How do you keep the hospitals open? How do you keep the power pump? Um, these are things that we should... Especially, especially when the, um, the way of spreading is via the network, you can't shut the network down because it's the same method you use to pump out your right. updates, right? And your defense. So where do you go, right? If you shut it down and start distributing USB sticks, well, that's another attack vector now. <laughs> <laughs> if I could add something just on, on, on this point of uh, advising senior executives, advising board members, etc. And this, this is interesting, and it came up in a Business Council of Australia meeting that I was involved in with Cisco a long time ago. And the CISO of Cisco, John Stewart, he basically sat down. We had chairmen of the board in this, in this room of major financials. And they sort of said, well, we're really concerned about this stuff. What can we as board members, what can we as senior executives do? And John looked at them and said, you need to have an advisor on your board or a board member who is a cybersecurity expert. A cyber security expert, not a salesperson, uh, someone who actually comes from the trenches who understands whichever aspect they might be a professional at, and there's a bit of a generalist, and that that needs to happen. Um, but in Australia, I would say, and I'm, I'm happy to, if anyone can tell me otherwise, but uh, being a member of the Institute of Company Directors and, and putting my hand up there for board memberships, I've never seen a role advertised for a cyber specialist on a board in this country. In the US, part of the course. One reason for that? Liability. And we just haven't quite. Starbands, obviously. Well, there are going to be new company directors' obligations coming out. Legislation is actually coming out to make it an obligation for company directors, same, same as CPRS 234, which only applies to financial services institutions. It's now going to apply for everybody. I've been in touch with the Australian Institute of Company Directors a number of times as well, and you're absolutely right. It's the same view. They can see it coming, but they're not really going to do anything because a lot of the boards are overwhelmed with so many different issues. I'm encouraged by your, your comment about CPS 234 being applied outside of APRA regulated institutions. That can only be a positive step um, because, as you say, when the board becomes liable for making sure that those systems and protocols and disciplines are in place and ideally having you know independent, unpaid advice at the board level, then okay. I think we're making a step forward. <laughs> and that's probably my positive contribution. There's some light at the end of the tunnel. That's the light at the end of the tunnel from my perspective. The, the, the question for the panel is, we've just gone through this huge disruptive, I don't know, it's amazing that we've gone through an hour and a half without saying something about COVID. But we've had this biological, um, this, this, this virus that's impacted the world so profoundly in so many ways. Um, and it's changed the way that we all live, the way that we all work. And um, without catastrophizing, what is the panel's opinion on if there was to be a true cyber attack um, in terms of on a critical infrastructure, does it not amaze you that there hasn't been something that has caused massive disruption in the way that the virus has? Or is, is that a likely is that likely to happen? Do we see like a sort of doomsday event going on through technology that is gonna sort of render you know, the way we work, the way that we live in a totally different way? I mean, I'm amazed that there's not been something that's happened to stop business continuity, essential service being able to be delivered, given the scope and the way that the, the technology has metastasized itself through our society. Are you not? Are you surprised, or am I, am I off the ball with Can you? I, I'll attempt to answer that yeah. as, as from the chair. <clears throat> I think sort of Ned 
started to touch on that. If we can take it as a given that the malware is already embedded in the systems, whether we can detect it or not, it's there. And it's nation state. Uh, the, the things that I think we have most to fear about would be nation state level capabilities because they generally have the largest budgets behind them. So Stuxnet was a case in point. You know, the most sophisticated, the most weaponized, the most, you know, the, the exploits that are carrying the most number of zero days that make them, you know, virtually unstoppable are largely, the, will be almost exclusively the work of either national security agencies and or, you know, militaries of some kind. So then the question you've got to ask is in what circumstances do they get activated? Now, if you look, I mean, I recently interviewed Malcolm Turnbull, I don't know, you might have seen it. We were talking about the Thucydides trap and the contest between nations, and it was the ancient war between Sparta and Athens. And that we were taught, we were trying to transpose that into the modern day situation to ask the question, in what circumstances will the contest between nation states begin to be played out in the cyber arena? And I think from my understanding of this and just observing it as a someone that understands cyber but also has a keen interest in geopolitics, to me the trigger will be geopolitical. The trigger will be uh, the attempt of a nation to assert its control over the decision-making of another sovereign nation. So you use these things as levers. And we've seen it a little bit already with Russia and Chechnya and the Ukraine. Taiwan has got to be quite a hot topic though. I mean. Yeah, so you, you think, put, put yourself in the position of the aggressor nation. You don't necessarily want to go out there immediately with all your attack tools straight away. What you'll do is you'll use, you'll try and use some form of soft diplomacy some rhetoric as they do within the national international media to say you know we, we think this is wrong or we believe that this position should be adopted or we take exception to the policies of this nation this sounds familiar by the way I'm well sorry. it's meant to yeah. you know i'm drawing on current events mm. and, and if that doesn't work so it's, you, you never go out with your heavy guns first you always go out with the rhetoric you try some diplomatic pressure as well that we never see, but it's behind the scenes. Embassy and ambassadors to ministers and threats and counter threats. And if that doesn't work, you might try sailing a few naval vessels down the coast. Or economic sanctions. Australia economic sanctions. San definitely <laughs> economic sanctions, you know, would come to play. But you do know that with cyber now, you've got another tool in the toolbox. And maybe it's the last tool that you use but it's the one where you take out the critical infrastructure and you say, now, are you ready to deal? Now are you ready to, you know, uh, concede to, to our, rat, our position? I think yes. that, that's this, so there's like an escalation. And I think I, cyber would be, and I'm sure, you know, ASD and our defense department, they're wargaming this stuff all the time, but cyber is absolutely in there now as one of the critical components and potentially the one that can do the most damage because you've got the attribution issue so that it buys time to the aggressor and deniability. So that's one big advantage. Secondly, cost. And thirdly, no casualties because you don't put boots on the ground when you do a cyber attack. So there are some unique advantages in cyber aggression, but, but I think they also realize that once you cross that line, it's like the one that fires the first nuclear missile. Once you set that chain off, there's no telling where that's going to end. Marching back into Rome. What's well, the Rubicon? Know, can't put that toothpaste back in the tube. Once mm. you create a global cyber war, I mean, we're, we're already in cyber war, I think it's fair to say. It's just an undeclared war. It's a cyber yeah. cold war. Yeah. <laughs> but there's a war. I mean, the, I said to a CEO a couple of years ago, we're in a state of war. It's just that we can't see the bullets flying by. Yeah. Unless you've got good packet sniffing. <laughs> so kids, if you're watching this, if you want a good career with a long-term future, cybersecurity is the game. Look, I want to thank our panelists again, Mark, Fergus, and Ned, and to the SIAN members that have been watching as part of the audience. So thank you very much for all of you.